it is very easy for us to see the power that our culture has in influencing us in that regard. A society can help us or hurt us. They can br uh, bring our thoughts to be more pure or less pure. And we see that our society can actively be working against us today and what they wear, what's on TV, the, the type of ideas and words that are, that are spoken in the media that we consume. In the same way, our culture can impact us when it comes to anger. And I think it's very important for us to, to understand that we have a culture that is very, very angry. And if we're not careful, we can allow ourselves to be caught up in that anger and let that anger take us away from the Lord. And if you're not sure about the, the anger around you, I think social media should quickly put any doubts to rest as you go look there. If you go and you look in the news and the things there, you see people are being reported on that are always angry. And in fact, what amazes me is that in our society, we have people who, as a form of entertainment, go and say provocative things just to make people mad. Now, you think this would be a terrible strategy. This would be something that would make people turn off the radio, turn off the television, stop paying attention to them, and they would not make any money at all. And yet, they actually make millions of dollars. Why? Well, some people want to hear what they have to say because they enjoy being mad at them. Other people enjoy what they have to say because they like seeing other people get mad and they want those, those entertainers to show them and to say the things that maybe they're not willing to say themselves. It amazes me that that could be a multi-million dollar career. But that says something about the society that we live in and how addicted people get to anger. And so with that in mind, I want us to take a moment to talk about what sinful anger looks like. And for me, this was really important because a lot of times when it comes to anger, typically if, if someone was going to be preaching a sermon on anger, I would, I would be, okay, well, that's going to be nice to listen, but I don't have a problem with anger, so it shouldn't be too big of a deal. Yet, then they would start preaching, and I would hear, I'm like, oh, maybe I am an angry person. And what's scary is, is that sometimes it can be so natural for us to be angry all the time that we really don't even think about it anymore. And that's why it's so important in Psalm 139, when the psalmist prays, Search me, O Lord, and let me see any evil way within my heart. And so by taking a look at the scripture, we can see what evil anger looks like and ask ourselves, is this something that, that maybe I do a little more often than, than I realized? So let's start with Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 22. Here we have Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He goes through the Beatitudes. He tells them that their righteousness has to exceed that of the Pharisees. And then, to prove that point, he starts in verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So Jesus starts out and he says, you've got to exceed that of the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they're comfortable with just not murdering. So hopefully no one here tonight has, has murdered anybody. But then... Jesus says, that's not even close to good enough. And he starts talking about insulting and calling people a fool. Do you ever listen to somebody, maybe a politician talk, and say, what a moron? 
What kind of idiot is this? Do you ever read a post on social media and think, man, this person is just such a fool. What are they even talking about? Even scarier, do you maybe sometimes wonder that about people's comments in Bible class? Or do you even go so far in personal Bible studies to get angry with them and think of them as a fool because they don't understand? Have you ever been confused about something the elders were doing with the congregation and looked at them as as fools and making foolish choices? We need to be careful because anger can be insidious. And a lot of times, those type of ideas, we may just have that as a fleeting thought. And, oh, well, you know, it's just a fleeting thought. It's, It's not a big deal. But what Jesus is saying is that this is indicating an angry heart, one that is liable for judgment. Another thing that we see is found in Psalm 37, verses 7 through 9. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoer shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Here he talks about there are people in the land, and it looks like they're actually over the land, and they are acting evilly. And what the psalmist is warning us, what David is warning us, is that if we're not careful, we'll take that anger, which may start out as righteous anger, but we'll let it fester inside of us. We will meditate on it, but not in the righteous way. We will allow it to consume our thoughts And we will allow it to turn into bitterness. It reminds us of what Paul says where he says, leave the vengeance to God because vengeance is of the Lord. Here, the psalmist is saying the same thing. God will take care of it in the end. You don't need to be spending all of your time fretting about their wrongs. You don't need to be spending all your time hoping for their justice to come. God's in charge of that. You don't need to worry about it. And so if we find ourselves constantly uh, having angry imaginings and, and thinking angry thoughts towards those who have wronged us to the evil people of the land, we may need to want, uh, ask ourselves, is our anger getting out of control? Also, in Proverbs... Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29, it says, Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Some of these things that we've been looking at previously may be a little more obvious, but I think this one can even be a a subtle way. If, If we're constantly in misunderstandings with other people, and a lot of times that misunderstanding is because we were quick to anger, and we thought that they said something that, you know, A month down the road when we talk it through with them, we found out that wasn't what they intended at all. Then we may be having issues with anger. And what we see here is that these misunderstandings are are very common for those who are quick to anger. And so if you're constantly having these these arguments and these, these misunderstandings, then that should be a warning to you. And we see the same type of idea in Proverbs chapter 15. Uh, Verse 18, it says, A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. And then in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 22. A man of wrath stirs up strife, and one given to anger causes much transgression. One of the things that we need to to evaluate in our lives is do we find that we're constantly having strife and arguments with those in our lives that may be in our family that may be in church that may be at work that may be 
uh, the, the little league coach that we're having to deal with. It may be in all of those areas. And in particular, if we see it happening in multiple areas, one of the things that's always important is, is if everybody has a problem, it may not be everybody else, it may be you. And so if we are living a life full of strife and contention, then we need to be asking ourselves, is anger at the root of my problem? Is anger causing these divisions with these people uh, that I'm supposed to be working with? So this gives us some ideas of what anger looks like. Hopefully it allows it to identify it in ourselves a little bit better. And there are a few different problems that arise from being angry. And obviously, that went way too far. Okay, we're back on track. <clears throat> All right, so there are a lot of different problems that can arise from being angry. Of course, we can have the idea of it being an issue um, because God tells us to, to be careful about being angry, to not sin in our anger. But we'll notice it again in our day-to-day -day lives. So first of all, uh, we see that if we're angry all the time, it's going to show up in our family life. It's going to show up in our relationships, in our friendships, in our work relationships. And so there is going to be constant strife and misunderstanding because we are not controlling our anger. We are not slow to anger. <clears throat> Another thing that, that happens is that our speech becomes corrupted. So let's take a look over at James chapter 1. So James chapter 1, verses 19 through 20 says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So James here talks about how we need to be slow to speak, but quick to hear. And in the context of that, what he says directly after is slow to anger. A lot of times whenever we're quick to anger, we're not listening very well, and we wind up saying things that we shouldn't. That's why the song Angry Words says what it says, because all of a sudden these things spout out. And that's, I think, what James has primarily in mind when he talks in James chapter 3. Here he's talking about the tongue and how we have to, to be careful about it. And starting in verse 5, it says, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is a set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives of a grapevine, <clears throat> or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. One of the things that he's pointing out here is that if your tongue is saying evil things, and in the context of this lesson this evening, if because you're angry you're being quick to speak and you're saying evil things in your anger, then you're actually diluting your influence. The things that, that you say, you, you can say blessings to God all you want, but if you are saying curses to the man that God created in his image, you're missing the point. And your speech no longer has the value. And especially when it comes to the outside world. 
If the outside world looks at us and they see Christians saying the same kind of angry, hurtful things that the rest of the world says, why would they think that we have anything different to offer them? We cannot let our mouths be saying evil things. We cannot be speaking the way that the world speaks. In the same way, our prayers and our worship are hindered. Take a look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. For kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it's pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place that men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. So we see here that Paul is telling Timothy, and he's explaining to them, uh, I think in particular, some of the ideas of, of public worship here and, and the type of prayers that they should have. And he talks about uh, making prayers for all people. And the idea behind these prayers comes from the fact that we are actually following in God's footsteps. Because God sent Jesus to die for all men. And so the goal is that all men are to be saved. And so then after that, he wraps up that we should pray lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Looking at the context here, I don't think what Paul had in mind was for people to say outside of services, you know, that Nero, he's an idiot. He has no idea what he's doing with the Roman Empire, and he just, uh, he, he's a moron. I'm sick and tired of Nero. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the nation that we live in, and we ask that you be with our leaders and that you help them to guide us into you. Is that what Paul's talking about here? Of course not. Going back to the fresh spring versus the, the impure spring. What Paul is talking about here is that our life and our prayer is consistent. That we are wanting for our nation, for all people, that they come to the Lord. And that we not allow anger and bitterness to control us in our attitudes toward them. And we see the same thing happen with us in our worship with one another. Take a look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 through 26. So if you'll remember, verses 21 and 22 are where we first saw this idea of anger being worthy of judgment and insulting people and calling somebody a fool. It's in the very next verse that Jesus continues saying, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. What Jesus is saying here is if you've sinned in anger, if you have spoken evilly of your brother or sister in Christ, before you bring your gift to the altar, before you come worship me, make that right. Because your worship is not acceptable to me 
if you have that outstanding sin, if you've allowed that anger to poison the relationship between you and your brother and sister in Christ. And so when we are angry, we're going to have constant strife and miscommunication. And the world's going to see that and they're going to say, well, we have strife and miscommunication and anger and, and we say the same type of things. God doesn't really seem to make a difference in their life, does it? And God's not going to be pleased with us either. He's going to know what it is that we're saying to other people. So when we come before him to pray and to worship, he already knows what's been happening. And he knows whether or not it's acceptable in his sight. So what do we do to combat the anger? And I think the, the, one of the best passages to look at this is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and verses uh, through verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 2. So it's interesting how he starts off here. He says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Now, it's very easy for us to want to latch on to that first part. Be angry and do not sin. Well, because of necessary inference, we understand that then there is a good time to be angry and that that is not sinful. Yes, that is true. But also, Paul is bluntly stating that Satan will take advantage of anything. And we see this throughout everything in life. Satan will take advantage of any holy thing and he will try to corrupt it and twist it to his purposes so that you are turned against him. And so Paul is very clearly saying, do not allow any righteous anger an opportunity for the devil to use it against you. And in that, he's making it very clear that that's something Satan is wanting to do, and that is something Satan succeeds in doing in people. And so we need to be on guard for that, and he warns us against a few different things, and we can kind of see the, the progression that, that anger takes here, where it may start off as righteous anger, but we then have bitterness. Again, we start fretting about it. It becomes in our soul, and we start hoping that bad things happen to those who have wronged us, that they get the justice that, that they deserve. It starts creating clamor, arguments, fights, difficulties. Even worse, when it starts impacting how we talk and the slander that we say. And now we start talking to other people and venting our anger to other people and saying evil and unkind things to others. And I think that goes back to <clears throat> what he was saying in verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Slow to speak. Because if we're speaking out of anger, there's a good chance that what we're saying is not providing grace to those who are listening. So we need to be extra sure about the things that we're saying. And again, the idea of malice, again, that, that bitterness now comes into actively trying to thwart those who have wronged us and hoping again for their destruction. I think it's very interesting in the middle of this passage what he talks about in verse 28, uh, where he, he mentions the thief. And I don't think the thief necessarily has anything to do with with the mindset of anger. But notice how complete Paul expects the thief to change their life. They come from stealing, being as selfish as possible, taking from others. But Paul doesn't just tell them, stop stealing. He then tells them, go get a job and start giving so that you may be of benefit to other people. And I think that's emblematic of how Paul views the Christian transformation. That we should take the sin that we had in our previous light, and now it should be working to go somewhere else. So notice the things that he talks about in verse 32. He talks about um, 
being kind to one another, that we should have kindness in the things that we say. We should be not just trying not to say malicious things, not just slandering people, but instead we should be looking to spread kindness. We should have a tender heart, looking to understand. I think that's what the Proverbs were referring to, is you're looking to have understanding. You're giving people the benefit of the doubt. You have a tender heart towards those people who have, uh, even those who have wronged you. And along that same line, the idea of forgiveness. And he mentions here the idea of the love of Christ. He, he notes that uh, what we should have is the, the forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And then that's where he transitions in chapter 5 where he says, Therefore, so again, therefore, because God in Christ forgave you, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. It goes from being angry and malicious to what did, what did God do for us? He gave himself for us. His entire goal was to restore that relationship. And I think it's interesting because, again, as, as I've kind of mentioned, when we look at be angry and do not sin, a lot of times the self-justification that comes up in my mind is, well, I, I, should, be, I should have righteous anger and I should, should stand up for the truth. And I think Stephen is an excellent example of this in Acts chapter 7. Because as he gets to the, the climax of his sermon in verse 51... He has no problem telling these Jews that they are being hard-hearted, that they are ignoring the word of God, and that they are wrong. They don't like that very much. So they pick up stones and they kill him with them. And in verse 60, he says, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. I'm reminded of that because that's very similar to what we see from Jesus. And I think it's real interesting because of who we know was there that Stephen was talking about. Paul was one of the people that Stephen said, don't hold this against him. What do you think Stephen would have thought about Paul being converted? About Paul being an apostle in the kingdom? which is a position that Stephen himself didn't actually obtain. I think he would have been excited that Paul came to the knowledge of God, that he repented and that he re received salvation, and excited for the good that was done in God's kingdom. Because it wasn't about bitterness. It wasn't about malice. He was standing for the truth. He told them how it was. But he always wanted their best interest. He always wanted them to come to the Lord. And I think that's instructive for us in what, again, being imitators of God because we walk in love as Christ walked in love and gave Himself for us. And so we need to make sure that as we're dealing with with our families, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, with the world, that we have not let the culture of anger infiltrate our hearts and dominate our thoughts, but instead that we have love. Our memory verse for this month has been, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So the question that I have for you is, do you love as God loves? That should always be our goal. If there's anyone here this morning who has been struggling with their relationship with God and with others, we're here to offer an invitation to help you to, to make that right. Whether that be coming to him for the first time and accepting the sacrifice that Jesus has, has given through the plan of salvation, or if it's through... Uh, coming forward and, and repenting as a, a son of God who has fallen away. We'd ask that you please come forward if you need our help in anything.